commercials are really good at seeing what demographics companies are targeting. It's also a good method of social commentary through stereotypes. It's one of the reasons why I enjoy watching these old commercials. Because it's, it's actually an unfiltered vision of some elements of the period. You know, this is how companies targeted people. This is what was popular at the time. These are the phrases that were popular at the time. Um, just all this stuff. It's, it's, I'd say commercials are more telling of a period of time than the movies or television programs that are from that time. And since companies try to figure out the inner workings of people in order to sell the products to them, um, when you look at the way they market stuff, you can see bits of the common inner workings of people in that period of time. You know, once you look at enough commercials from a particular year or a particular, you know, set of few years, it's just, it, they give a lot of insight and that might seem strange to some people. Especially when I say that it, that you get more from the uh, commercials than you do the movies. But, I mean, movies movies are more meant to tell a story. Like, commercials are, are propaganda, basically. They're trying to sell some product that you don't need. They're trying to say, uh, uh, pay attention to this thing uh, that you don't need, but pay attention anyway and get this in your mind uh, whenever, you, uh, whenever you think of this. Uh, put our product there, even if it's not even the, the, remotely the same kind of product. Uh, we want you to think about us. You know, they're not, commercials aren't trying to tell a story. They're not trying to tell some spectacular situation. They're trying to get their product in your, in your mind as quickly as possible. Getting you to associate one thing with another. Movies aren't designed to do that. Uh, I mean, you could say that, well, there are some scene, scenes that might be that way, and it's like, well, yeah. But that's not the entire point of, of every second in that movie, you know, or television program. It's not, I mean, with commercials, every second counts. It's kind of, it's product propaganda. There was a period in the 80s where it was popular for uh, big competing companies like Coke and Pepsi or the different fast food chains or whatever to do negative campaigning, negative propaganda campaigning against uh, their competitors. I mean, it happens once in a while anymore, but I mean, it's not, it wasn't this hard, hard focus on that. At some point, I'll, I would like to, I would like to do some videos about commercials and give examples of those commercials that's more of more of a serious tone and, and, and a, uh, I guess you could say a, a documentary, a biased documentary, because I don't have other people working for me, proofreading and all that sort of thing, and making sure that I'm not shoving forth hyperbole or, or whatnot, you know. So it'll be a, a biased documentary of uh, about commercials. I, I, I would like to do that at some point, because I think there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of things we can learn from commercials. And it has nothing to do with, with the products that are being advertised. It, it just has to do with um, learning the history of how our mindsets change. What, what is crammed forth by media as to what we're supposed to think is important? And, and what kind of associations are acceptable at that time? And what kind of associations are not acceptable at that time? Sometimes there, it's it's a it's what you don't you never see in a commercial that's more telling than what you're actually seeing. So, you know, it's like these are the the modes of thought, these are the trains of thought that are bad right now. 
sort of like eggs, you know. Well, uh, oh, no, now they're good for you. Well, no, now they're bad for you. And then over these, well, you know, they're, they're good for you. They're okay, but as long as you, you know, the yolk is okay as long as you have the whites. Whatever, right? Um, butter is good. Butter is bad. Butter is good. Well, it's, it's better than the margarine. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, so there, there, are, there are certain things that become in vogue as far as uh, what we're not supposed to think about or talk about or what companies aren't supposed to think about or talk about if we were to anthropomorphize a company. <laughs> um, because they're, they're, they consist of people, but you know, whatever. But this whole thing also has me thinking about the way that black people are portrayed. And I think probably the best period for the way black people were portrayed was uh, in the 1970s to the, uh, probably the, uh, well, no, the, eight, the 80s just started to introduce a different set of things. It really did. It, it, the, um, the stereotype became all about uh, sports, started to become all about sports. But in the 70s, there, there were some, there was a push by everywhere to, to include black people in positive lights in, in if, uh, I don't know how else to word this. If, if this, this word offends you, I'm sorry. I don't know of another word to use, but, you know, celebrating ethnic things, ethnicity, uh, uh, you know, celebrating Afro hair, celebrating one's appearance, even though it's totally different than the standards that you find, uh, you know, the, the white standards. There were there was some individuality going on there, and it, and it was celebrated. And it, they didn't shove forth the chicken and watermelon stereotypes. What was pushed forth is that black people have class, and I thought that was that was a really great message that that used to be during that period. Kind of started in the uh, later '60s, probably I'd say around '67, '67 to. 79 or maybe and, and it still had bleed over until about 82 man the 90s the 90s were the the, the years where and this is and this is these are the years when black people had stereotypes about them that were really damaging and those stereotypes have never went away you know, in previous years when there were some of the bad stereotypes, it was stuff like, you know, chicken and watermelon and, oh, look at the big lips and the wide nose and, oh, well, let's put a plate in our, our lip or something like that. And it was very distasteful. That was nothing compared to uh, what happened in the 90s. In the 90s, it became, you know, oh, you're a thug, gangsta or a criminality up on a pedestal. There's this stereotype of that. And previous to the 90s, you know, there were, there, there were certainly a lot of, of racists out there who would say really negative things. Uh, usually it would, it would allude to some idea that black people are stupid. But that still wasn't as damaging as what happened in the 90s. I mean, there were plenty of black comedians in the 90s who did a great job, but that's not really the same thing. And if you look into a lot of the uh, gangster rap uh, groups, artists, whatever, um, that came out in the 90s, you know, look at some of the record labels, look at who were at the top, top, top of those uh, record labels, you know, who are the ones really making the decisions and, you know, why are they making these decisions and why are they only supporting black artists that do a certain thing and yet the white artists that they support say another set of things. And I mean, and then with that, I can't, you can't necessarily say that was, it was racist, but it does have to do with sensationalizing things and what gets sometimes, what sometimes gets done in the name of sensationalism. But if you look at some of that stuff, it's just like, okay, why, why did this 
Why did this occur like this? And some people, will, well, you know, we have, but uh, but but that can't be because we had a liberal president, you know, as we had a, a, a Bill Clinton during those uh, most of those years, and yeah, the Democrats haven't been uh, haven't had a very good uh, past when it comes to uh, at least in the in the past uh, thirty years they haven't had that good of a past when it comes to handling uh, issues of. Uh, of racism and race. But these stereotypes have never come to an end. The, the thug, uh, gangster, uh, criminal uh, element uh, to the stereotypes has not come to an end. And in some ways it's gotten worse. If we're to return to any period in the past, I think the... Uh, 60s and 70s would be a much better period to return to than the 50s or the 80s. 50s and the 80s are just... The Republicans just love the 50s and the 80s. They just love it. The 50s are when you could hate on the beatniks, and the 80s is when you can hate on the hippies. Whereas in the later 60s and 70s and the 90s, you could uh, put down the established way that you're supposed to act and supposed to be. Um, I mean, in the 80s, it, everything was about being over the top. So no matter how over the top you were, you were still kind of mainstream because that's just what the 80s was about. Massive sensationalism in just about everything. And then the 90s came along and we're, let's go back to being raw. And, it, and it's in more than just the music. It, it was in, in a number of other areas. Um, social attitudes were that way. That's why the music was that way, too. The music was reflective of the, of the mindset of the period. And the 90s was very much anti-religious establishment. I mean, yeah, we did some interesting things in those periods, and, I, and there has to be some sort of ebb and flow. There's, the, the pendulum always seems to swing. But I don't know whether this was the right time for it. Not with the way that information uh, is gathered on the internet. The way the internet has actually made us more closed-minded rather than open-minded. And this is out of how it's allowed us to form all these little, I don't know, sub-tribes, uh, little factions. And we create our little echo chambers. We live in these little bubbles more than ever before. Before, there were only so many, and now there are countless little bubbles. The way that people spread information on the internet, whether it's uh, true or false information. The way that gossip is on the internet. I mean, this is like the, an issue of the worst timing possible. For all of these things to come together. The worst timing possible. You know, there's so many things we should have had sorted out before someone like Trump would get into office. There's so many, there's so much shit we should have had sorted out. But now, I just, I, I can't, it's, it's very, very difficult for me to see any other outcome but complete chaos in the next, uh, in the next couple of years. Just chaos, social chaos. I, I don't know what we're going to do about it. I don't know how we're going to stop it. This ball is rolling. And let me tell you, it's going incredibly fast. It's like a spaceship in outer space where you have virtually uh, infinite inertia. And so if you just keep applying a, uh, some sort of uh, engine that propels you forward, um, you can just keep adding to the speed that you're going. There, there's some other math that goes into that too. But, um, and so it, it's rate of increase is, it's doing what the... SJWs have wanted uh, the majority of the populace to do when it comes to being open-minded. Like I've mentioned before, 
you know, people can only become more open-minded at a certain rate. Um, that's the maximum it can be. And it's usually a, you know, a slow and steady rate. But a lot of the SJWs are wanting people to go, well, no, don't do, don't just keep doing this. Go like this. You know, the, 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 the more open-minded you get, the quicker you should get even more open-minded. You know? But this sort of thing that's that's catching on, you know, because of these bubbles that people have been able to create, and because people aren't really making that much of an effort to try to explain their positions, they they're they're so happy with the support they're able to get from those who already agree with them that they feel they don't have to do so, as much work because look at all this support I get. Well, that support is meaningless if you're not actually communicating anything to the other side. That's, that's as far as I'm concerned. But um, but yeah, a apathy towards uh, other people, other demographics, other viewpoints, other mindsets is going full force. And I've been involved in this myself. I, I, there, it's it's hard to, to not just react to this stuff. And it's especially frustrating, as I've said, with how there are so many people who are calling themselves on the left and the primary things they're supporting have nothing to do with being on the left. Unfortunately, this mindset that's, that's becoming popular is closed-minded, it is bigoted. Oh, we need to come together as a tribe, no matter how shitty the tribe is. Because these people over here made me feel uncomfortable. I don't know how we're going to even stop it from continuing to increase in speed. It's like so many people have just sort of, I don't know, people, it's, we've collectively lost our minds. And I know some would say the same thing about uh, a lot of the Democrats because they're willing to uh, do things that go against some of the principles of this government. People just completely ignoring all the things that in the past we would be screaming bloody murder at when it comes to Republicans. But somehow, because it's Trump, well, it's all different. And we say, well, look at the people he's putting in his cabinet. Look at what the pe those people stand for. Look at look at all this stuff. And you're just like, not to worry, it's Trump. What what's wrong with you? Hello? Just give Trump a chance. I, I, I don't I don't really know what it is. Is it because oh well he's not politically correct, so let's worship him. And, you know, and some of the people are actually saying, well, you know, well, so what if if Russia uh, hacked the U.S. election? So what? Look at what they uncovered. I'm like, yeah, what they uncovered, that's, that's important for us to see that. But we still need to look at the idea that Russia, if, if Russia did this, okay, I don't, I don't see enough proof to, to show that they did. So I'm not going to make any sort of definitive statement that they did. But if they did, uh, there are people that are saying, well, I don't care if they did or not. Uh, what matters is what they uncovered. And I'm like, do you not see... If, if election fraud had been committed due to another country's uh, 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 hacking or meddling in the affairs of, uh, that's messed up. And you know what? Yes, the United States has done that to other countries, and it's unacceptable. Two wrongs don't make a right. Five wrongs don't make a right. Twenty wrongs don't make a right. You know, if you're going to use that as an argument, it, that's not really an argument, uh, you know, you're, uh, as to whether or not uh, we should even look at uh, this sort of thing as bad. Well, the U.S. government does it too, so shut up. I don't think the U.S. government should do it either. You know, some of you are shoving forth that, well, that shouldn't be a concern at all. 
for some of you, no, no amount of anything that Trump could do would make you no longer like practically fuck practically fucking worship the guy. The amount of po apologetics that I'm seeing from people towards Trump is... I'm sorry, it's kind of terrifying. I've, I've never seen this sort of... It, it's, it's cultish. It's cultish. In the way that people just eat... I mean, it's it eat up everything that he says. It's, it's, it's like he's a cult leader. I'm not saying he is a cult leader, but it's, but he could be, who knows, but he's like a cult leader, you know, cult of personality. Now, some people could say the same thing was done to Obama. I suppose that's true. Obama stood out as an incredibly articulate, great orator, and someone who can it doesn't even have to write a speech i mean he might have some ums here and there but he can really really well he knows how to state presidential uh things on the fly instantly he has all the right words and all the stuff that he's, he's saying has some sort of meaning when he's at the un sometimes he speaks a lot of hot air but a lot of fluff a lot of Hallmark card kind of stuff, but usually when he's speaking to the U.S. press, the, the, the stuff that he says is, is generally done in a, as a matter of fact kind of way. But a lot of people, including myself, were somehow willing to look past some of uh, Obama's flaws. His administration has, I mean started more wars you know and how did he get the nobel peace prize when he didn't he hadn't even done anything you know oh, look he's he, he gets a nobel prize excuse me for, for for what for becoming president you know congratulations you became president uh you get a peace award that part never made any sense to me but i still for some reason let it pass Okay, I did not criticize Obama not enough. On the Jimmy Dore show, he has pointed out a lot of things that are messed up about Obama. A lot of things I didn't want to look at. And I highly recommend his channel. Some people may not want to look at him because he's associated with the Young Turks, but he's one of the people who likes to fact check. He's one of the people who well, he's he's not Jenk, okay? He's not Jenk. He's not the 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 lady who sits next to him most of the time, whom I forgot her name, who always has this smug attitude whenever she talks about her opinions of others. Uh, very, very smug, very condescending. And I don't think she's trying to be, but that's just how she comes off. That's her body language. That's the way that she talks about things. Um, I don't think it's intentional, but media has propped up Obama for his entire administration. Um, the only one saying anything otherwise might have been Fox News, and they had a whole shit ton of stupid things that they'd criticize Obama for. I really do appreciate independent media. I think it's sad when there are people who will discredit anything that comes from the left and really i don't really i i don't understand people's absolute hatred of the young turks i don't get it i really don't if they see authority figures doing something wrong they like to call it out um yeah they're yeah they've got some bias you know they've got a liberal bias they don't pretend that they don't have a liberal bias you know, some people are upset because they don't like to uh, make Muslims all out to be uh, evil and that sort of thing. Uh, they're supposed to basically emulate uh, alt-right publications. 
And because they won't emulate alt-right publications, uh, they're just... They make you angry. They're SJW cucks. They're, you know, whatever. You know, if you want, if you want your alt-right viewpoints, then go to one of your alt-right sites. Don't sit there and get pissy towards a, 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 a an independent liberal uh, sort news source uh, because they say liberal things. And if your thing is, well, their liberal ideology is wrong. Well, in, from our perspective, your alt-right ideology is wrong. So I guess we're even, right? Most of the reactions to anything the Young Turks puts out is, but, 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 but what about black on black crime? And uh, black people commit more crimes. We need to worry about Muslims. What is it with you and this identity politics shit? And most of all, there are comments that are just insults. Just just insults. There's there's no there's no substance to them at all. Um, just insults. Not even saying things that are as a matter of a fact. No, no, they're just insults. And then there's all the people who will just agree with everything the Young Turks say. And there are indeed a lot of, of psychophants. You know, there are the psychophants on pretty much all sides. So, But going back to what this video was originally talking about is, you know, the power of media, the power of advertising, uh, stereotypes that get pushed out, what's acceptable and what isn't. Now, I've got to say there is some self-sabotage elements in the black community towards white people. You know, oh, cultural appropriation. Just just that concept by itself. Well, that this is our thing, and, and, and let us have our thing to us. I guess maybe that's one of the things that, that... That adds some tensions to this. I mean, I can understand why people will feel that white people, their culture is to appropriate other cultures sort of like asset stripping. There could be some truth to that, which is why we don't have a problem with the idea of grabbing whatever we want from any culture. I don't understand what's wrong with grabbing whatever we want from any culture. I think the way that we can make society better is if we take all of the things that we like about other cultures, about any culture, just celebrate the things that we like. I mean, how can you really be an individual if you're not applying to yourself as many things that you like about others uh, from other cultures? I mean, how can you really say that you're being yourself if you just allow yourself to, to stick to a particular standard you might have been raised with? And isn't doing that kind of thing uh, celebrating traditionalism? Why should people have to stick with their culture? That's a very traditionalist mindset. But, now see, here's the thing. For the people that would, are watching this video and you're going, oh yeah, that, that's right, oh, yeah, great. Okay, why don't you want to apply that all the way down the line then? Why does globalism scare you that much? If, if, if globalism was done uh, not for the sake of greed, but for the sake of, hey, we need to allow the, the human race to continue. Um, what problem do you really have with globalism? What is so damn important about nationalism? What's so, I mean, what's so fucking important about it? Why, why are we so tied to that idea? To me, it's an outdated idea. It's an idea that is probably going to go out the window in the next 50 years. I'd say it could the, that whole that whole process could start though in probably ten years when automation starts affecting things in extreme ways, and is going to make it, capitalism is going to fail. I've said this a bunch of times. Capitalism is going to fail. Now, it maybe it'll take longer than I think to fail, but it's eventually going to fail, and it will be replaced with something else. And maybe if we 
voice our opinions about what that something else could be because ideas can spread ideas can spread like a cancer or bacteria and if we are trying to look to the future then maybe some of the ideas we shove forth now might be in enough people's psyche to affect the future in some way when we're dead and gone I mean that's all we can really hope for even the tiniest little budge in in contributing to uh, needed social change. Coming off of capitalism is going to be very rough. No matter no matter how you look at it, it's going to be rough. I'm hoping that we're going to have eventually have someone in office who will work very hard at making the transition to a globalist type of of system with uh, resource and wealth redistribution, what can make that possible without it hurting too badly? You know, what, how can we reduce harm? You know, how can we keep it everyone from just rioting? Uh, some of us are seeing the rioting on the wall when it comes to uh, uh, globalism and when it comes to what automation is going to do to capitalism. We are going to have automation that, that makes any automation we've had in the past look just pathetic. It just, um, I mean, we have to think about what kind of government would we have if we lived in a Jetsons world? What would the government actually have to be if we had that kind of technology? That's what's coming. Not necessarily the flying cars, although I suppose it could but certainly uh, uh, drones delivering packages, uh, robots doing the jobs of humans far more efficiently than humans. Um, You know there's going to be people out there who are going to call for us to ban technology. You know that's coming. You know damn well that's coming. There's going to be all the people that will say, let's ban technology. Oh, great. Yeah, that, that'll go over really well. Terrible idea, but there are going to be people that, that uh, call for it. You know, there are. So if we have, shouldn't have to, you know, tie allegiance to a particular culture, why do we need to do that? Why this attitude about, uh, you know, nationalism? Especially those of you who say that you're against identity politics. Why is that still so strong? Why does the idea of globalism terrify so many people? I understand the negative sides to if, if globalism is done purely for greed of companies. Yeah, I get that. Okay, I get that. But other than, than that potential, it's not necessarily the way that it, it would come into place, but, you know, besides that potential, um, what do you hate so much about globalism? And what is so damn important about nationalism? Nationalistic ideas allow people to excuse any sort of status quo. It will allow us to excuse terrible behaviors. Nationalism is why Obama has been able to do some of the shit that he's done. Why Bush was able to do what he did. And now why uh, people are kissing uh, Trump's feet, figuratively, anyway. I think a lot of people for a long time have wanted to say the things that they're saying now. You know, now that Trump's going to be president, the gloves come off and we don't have to uh, censor any of our, our viewpoints, no matter how nasty they are. You know, who cares about this unwritten social uh, doctrine set of values and rules that we shove forth in order to try to keep the peace. You know, who cares about any of that anymore? That's out the window. Some people purely blame this on the left. And I can see why. I can see why you would, you would think this. Once we started having different groups blame an entire demographic for all of our problems, Primarily, simply because that demographic is in the majority, 
And then the people that will say that someone is racist just because they are of, of a certain demographic. Um, I, I, no, no, that was that was a very, very bad move on a number of people's parts. Throwing away dictionary, colloquial and historical definitions of words, and then knowing that people use the original definitions of, let's say, racism, Knowing that, that people are using the colloquial dictionary and historical definitions, um, and you know that, you know, you know that's their definitions, you'll still use the word racism in the new way and expect them to just go with it. Well, because that's what they teach in sociology. Well, that's nice and all, but you actually need to communicate with other people. So if you know that, that someone uses a particular definition, then discuss it within the definitions that they know. You can remind them over and over again that, well, we should be discussing it this way, but I'm still going to try to discuss this in the way that you know. No, you won't, you won't do that. Turning white people into the enemy is a dumb move. Whether or not, uh, I mean, I certainly don't agree with a number of things that a lot of people do and that includes white people, that doesn't mean that I should shove forth negative things about white people as a whole. That would be just as bad as when it's done to any other race. Though there is the power element, you know, if, if the, uh, a group that has more power and, you know, a group that's part of a system that is that has more power can do more damage that's for sure. It can affect people's lives more profoundly. Yeah, that's for sure. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that you get to redefine a word and then and then say, uh, you know, redefine racism and say, well, you know, black people can't be racist because that's not how it's defined. Well, that is how it's defined. That's how it has been historically defined. That's how it is colloquially defined. That's what the dictionary says. And you can go on and on and on about how, uh, uh, well, the dictionary doesn't matter. It does matter. Um, the dictionary definition of feminism matters. So, you know, why does it suddenly not matter when it's the word racism or sexism? Why, why do those things suddenly, you know, the dictionary is no longer valid. Only your sociology professor and your feminist theory scholarly articles have defined the words that way. But I can see why people might blame the left for this sort of thing, and I'd say they definitely contributed to this. But society has been changing for quite a while. For at least 15 years, we didn't have these anti-gay bills, these religious freedom bills, being shoved forth. They, they tried to shove them forth in the early 90s. By the time you got to around 97, they just weren't trying anymore. They just didn't even, they, they knew they had no chance. But over the past, you know, four years or so, they've had a chance again, and they've gotten some footing. You know, there is a creeping, uh, you know, people talk about creeping Sharia. Well, well here we've got this creeping fundamentalist thing going on and there are atheists out there who who almost defend it what i'm waiting to to see is if uh people who call themselves atheists will start to say oh yeah christians are being persecuted you know they're the ones in the majority and uh they should have the right to be represented as the majority and so it is offensive to, to not say Merry Christmas kind of thing. I'm just waiting to see something like that. The argument from some people seems to boil down to, well, you know, Christian culture built this country and built everything that, that you use now. You better show respect. It's like, uh, you know, the same thing as people saying, you better respect your elders. Well, no, I'll respect my elders if they're respectable. You know, I'll respect authority figures if they're respectable. I'll respect people who are respectable. I'll respect people who show respect towards me. But a culture and a people 
do not deserve respect just because, uh, well, you know, they, uh, uh, they built these things. A culture that built the foundations for something shouldn't be respected just because in the past they built the foundations for something. You know, that's part of history. That's not current times. If that same culture that was responsible for building things has become a hindrance for a lot of other people, and you're going out of your way to make it difficult for anyone that isn't a part of that culture, uh, that's not respectable. Respect has to be earned. And you're not going to earn it by trying to cram your religion down everyone's throats. You're not going to gain respect by trying to codify your political ideology and shame anyone who doesn't follow it. That's not going to get you respect. You're not going to earn it by fucking over minorities. You're not going to earn it that way. Some atheists in the alt-right uh, side of things. Because that's one of the things that's being shoved forth right now, is that the dominant culture should be the ones to call the shots on everything. The dominant culture should rule. Now, I understand the dominant culture is the dominant culture, obviously, or it wouldn't call it the dominant culture. But if you think that the dominant culture should uh, be the one to call the shots, then why are some of you against getting rid of the Electoral College? Well, maybe it isn't quite the dominant culture as you'd like to think, but you want to make sure it's pushed out as being, you know, the most important. I've seen a number of hints that, you know, show that, well, someone white can talk about their experiences. And there are things that any demographic could deal with. And that's great. It's, it's totally fine to talk about that. But if a gay person talks about their experiences, well, then they're just a, a whiny faggot. If a woman talks about her experiences as a woman, she's considered uh, you know, whining, uh, being pathetic. Uh, uh, just them talking about something they've experienced is considered man-hating just because they talked about a, a situation they went through with another man. Granted, I'm not trying to say there aren't uh, women who hate men, because there certainly are. You know, but if a white guy talks about his experiences, you know, oh, that's great. Because generally, generally, the things that a cis, white, straight male goes through that's negative has nothing to do with them being a straight, white, cisgender male because there really aren't any issues that straight, white, cisgender males go through that other demographics don't also go through. But there are plenty of things that other demographics, other than straight, white, cisgender males, go through as a result of being the demographic that they fit, but they're not supposed to talk about it. And they're certainly not supposed to try to get help related to those things. Because, you know, that's identity politics. There seems to be this notion from a lot of, sorry, uh, straight white males, and this isn't all of them, but this, this is a notion that gets shoved forth, is that we shouldn't consider the experiences that those who only certain demographics go through we should only consider experiences from people that, that everyone can, can deal with. Because if we create any laws or create any narratives about those who do experience things differently, that who, who experience things in a negative way that no other demographic has to deal with, that we're being racist and sexist against straight white men. So basically what it boils down to is that uh, all laws, all narratives should focus on straight white men. And 
if you make it good for straight white men, it will just trickle down to everyone else. In that video about Black Lives Matter uh, by uh, TED Talks, they had mentioned some of this, and I, I happened to agree with it, and I should have, in that video, talked about the, more of the areas that I agreed. Um, you know, trickle-down doesn't work for just about anything, and it's certainly not going to work for, uh, for racial issues. It hasn't worked. That's why we haven't really moved very far forward from the 50s on this stuff. You know, I'm, saying, I'm not saying we haven't moved forward at all, and there are some people who very, very much exaggerate what I'm saying. But we haven't moved forward really that far since the 50s. We got to the point that we did in the 60s and 70s. And then, as I said earlier, it just started to kind of revert back closer to the 50s. And since Trump got elected... We're going, it's, it's like, well, welcome back, 1950s, welcome back. Um, people like Eagle Eye are trying to say, oh, well, we're not going to revert back. I say, well, we already have. We've already mostly done it. And if this continues, we will finish that progression. Okay, I, if we're going to revert back to a period, I think it'd be nice to, again, as I said, it'd be nice to revert back to the 60s and 70s, but that's not going to happen because Republicans love the 50s and the 80s. So how are we going to tackle these issues in the future? I have no idea. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. I don't know how we're going to get out of this without uh, some sort of a, a, an actual cultural war. I have no idea what's coming up. No idea. I've never it's I've never felt more of a of a, of an unknown kind of thing. I think one of the only things that could get us out of the division that we have is if a non-Muslim country attacked us and it was clear who exactly who attacked us had a, some sort of physical attack on us. And we all came together against a common enemy. That's about the only thing that I think that could break us out of this pattern that we're currently going in. And that, that really, that would, uh, it, it would, it would be uh, probably uh, less than two weeks and we'd be shaped up pretty fucking quickly. Don't know how long it would last. But that would shape us up pretty quickly. Right now, there's really nothing holding us together. During the Obama administration, we had a facade holding us together, which is better than nothing. But now, there's nothing holding us together. If your answer, if your answer is saying, oh, Trump, dude, uh, g g take off your Trump-tinted uh, glasses, uh, uh, you know, stop idolizing Trump, stop putting him up on some pedestal like this. Stop worshiping Trump. Stop like bowing to some someone that's that you're you're treating like a cult leader. I just can't believe some of people's arguments. This was thought during the election, but Trump had even said well he could you know he could probably shoot someone point blank and they'd still vote for him. Well the way it is now People, he could, he could shoot someone point blank, and people say, would say, "Well, we need to forgive him because he's the president." That's how far this kind of apologetics is going. Yeah, stop turning Trump into a cult leader. Thanks.